Hello, welcome everybody. I am so pleased to have you here with us this evening on Stimo Live. I'm Erica Rand Silverman, and I am one of the literary agents at Stimola Literary Studio, the proud representatives of the authors who are on our uh, event this evening. And you'll be joining us as authors and educators talk about biographies for children and a new, truly, absolutely incredible resource for educators and parents who want to be sharing uh, books, uh, biographies with their own kids. It's called the Biography Clearinghouse, and you'll hear a bit about it further after I come off the screen. So without further ado, I am going to bring in Marianne Capiello, who is uh, who teaches children's literature at Lesley University, and Xenia Tajiowan, who is an associate professor of language and literacy at Penn State Harrisburg. They will be introducing our authors. And um, at the end of the event tonight, uh, I will come back on the screen. I will thank you all for staying with us. And then I will get to announce the winners of, um, of the giveaway books uh, for this evening. So stay with us. And here we have Marianne. Marianne, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And Xenia. And I can't wait to listen in. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for joining us and for spending some time tonight digging deeply into the art of biography and the potential it has for the classroom and in the lives of young people. All of us who will be speaking tonight on the panel are members of the inaugural journey of the Biography Clearinghouse this year, both as educators and authors. So, first, I'm going to introduce um, our author panel and I'm going to read. Uh, my introductions, and then as the evening progresses, we'll have more of a freeform conversation. <clears throat> so joining us tonight, Tanya Lee Stone joins us from Vermont. Tanya is the author of Girl Rising, Courage Has No Color, and Almost Astronauts, as well as a range of young adult biographies, as, as, as well as picture book biographies, such as Pass Go and Collect $200, Who Says Women Can't Be Doctors, the House That Jane Built, and more. Tanya's work has been recognized by the NAACP Image Award, the Robert F. Seibert Medal, the Golden Kite Award, Bank Street Flora Strauss Stieglitz Award, Jane Addams Award, Yelsa Nonfiction Finalist, Boston Globe Horn Book Honor, NPR Best Books, and NCTE's Orbis Pictus Honors. Tanya, thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Also joining us from New York is Lisa Klein Ransom. Lisa is the author of picture book biographies such as Before She Was Harriet, The Power of Her Pen, the groundbreaking journalist Ethel Payne, Game Changers, the story of Venus and Serena Williams, Counting the Stars, the story of Katherine Johnson, NASA mathematician, Just a Lucky So-and-So, the story of Louis Armstrong, and my Story, My Dance, Robert Battle's Journey to Alvin Ailey, <clears throat> and many more. Lisa's books have received numerous honors and awards, including NAACP awards, Kirkus Best Books, School Library Journal Best Books, New York Public Library Best Books, ALA Notables, and NCTE Notable, the CBC Choice Award, Top 210 Sports Books for Youth, an Orbis Pictus Recommended Book, and ILA Teacher's Choice, and a Jane's, Jane Adams Award. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. Happy to be here, thank you. And finally, from Illinois, Barb Rosenstock joins us tonight. <clears throat> Barb is the author of picture book biographies, such as Leave It to Abigail, The Revolutionary Life of Abigail Adams, Fight of the Century, Alice Paul Battles Woodrow Wilson for the Vote, Prairie Boy, Frank Lloyd Wright Turns the Heartland into a Home, through the Window, Views of Mark Chagall's Life and Art, Otis and Will Discover the Deep, the record-setting dive of the bathysphere, and The Secret Kingdom, Net Chan, A Changing India, and A Hidden World of Art. Barb's book, The Noisy Paint Box, illustrated by Mary Grand Pre, received a Caldecott honor in 2015. Other awards include an Orbis Pictus honor, a Sidney Taylor honor, 
the California Library Association Beattie Award, Kirkus Best Books, New York Public Library Best Books, CLA Notable Children's Books, Bang Street Best Books, School Library Journal Best Books. Thanks for joining us, Barb. Thanks, I am so happy to be with all of you. It's a privilege for all of us to be in the virtual room with all of you. So thanks to the three of you for having this conversation. And so for the audience, Zinnia and I will be moderating a conversation. And as Erica said, as you have questions, you can put them in the chat and she will be moderating that. So before we begin with our questions for our author panel, Zinnia and I just wanted to share a little bit about the inception of the Biography Clearinghouse, what we're striving to do collectively, all five of us, as well as a group of other educators and book creators. So the conversation we're having tonight is really one that started over lunch two years ago in Houston. Me and Barb Rosenstock at lunch. In October of 2018, I received an email from Barb. And this is gonna embarrass her perhaps because I didn't tell her that I was gonna share this. Mm -hmm. But this very idea began when I opened up my email inbox and I found an email from Barb saying, I'm looking to learn more about biography in the classroom, the history of how it's been used and how it can be used or be useful going forward. My long-term goal is to work up a site promoting a wider use of biography in the classroom that contains a variety of educational materials, plans, ideas, video interviews, webinars, discussions about its use across the curriculum. In a follow-up email to me, she wrote, what I'd like to see, if teachers think it would be helpful, is a clearinghouse of sorts, posts, lessons, that use biography not as the focus in terms of biography, not organized by person, but in terms of content and curriculum. So many kids love the real stories about real people, so do adults. But bios aren't typically used in the regular reading mix or as intros to content. So I, she had me, I wanna learn more about biography. <laughs> so we sat down for lunch in Houston we talked for two hours, and the reality is we've kind of been talking about this for two years pretty regularly. And in that conversation, we decided we wanted to amplify the incredible artistry and work that's happening in picture book and chapter book biographies right now. But we also wanted to shift the focus of teaching biography to not just teaching biography, but teaching with biography. We can teach biography as a genre, but we can also teach everything else with biography. So we brainstormed some ideas and we gathered together an incredible group of people. So I just wanna affirm that everything we're talking about tonight has been a group effort by a variety of people. There are five of us here with you on the screen, but a whole bunch of other people that are working on this. So I'm gonna turn you over to Zenia now, who's gonna to explain to you a little bit about what we've created on the Clearinghouse, and then we'll have our conversation. Hi everyone, it's such an honor to be here among uh, these uh, wonderful people talking to you about uh, the work that we've been doing. So, um, the story started with those emails and that lunch. And uh, then once we all got together, we actually pursued an endorsement from the Children's Literature Assembly of NCT, um, which we were given. So after we, uh, we received that, we started meeting um, through Zoom and we started uh, monthly meetings in the, uh, June uh, 2019. So during those meetings, we discussed our shared love of the genre of biography, and we talked about our experience and our beliefs over the potential of biographies to be read for pleasure, but also for academic learning. And we also talked about their capacity to, in that process, spark wonder and questions for readers, mm -hmm. evoke empathy and a sense of belonging, and even inspire change and innovation. So. Through these conversations, we began to start to solidify our ideas and we crafted a set of principles to guide us. And in those principles, we affirmed that biographies can and do support literacy development, as well as serve a content area or disciplinary literacy objectives and facilitate socio-emotional learning. So once we established those principles, we then constructed a framework 
to support our discussion of biographies and investigate and explore their role in the curriculum. So, uh, and this framework is pretty interesting because it involves a vision of interconnectedness uh, across text, teacher and students, and uh, biography creators. So once this foundational work on, was in place, we then began creating and curating content, uh, which we publish on our website, uh, which you can find at the Biography Clearinghouse, all one word, dot org, and on the CLA blog, which is a weekly blog that is published by the Children's Literature Assembly. So uh, on our website, you will find a growing list of book entries for specific biographies, as well as other resources. Uh, the book entries are pretty exciting. I'm so proud of uh, how wonderful and, and helpful they are. Um, they are organized along our a model that we created, which um, runs threads across investigate, explore, and create. And they include rich curricular recommendations Recommendations for bringing these particular books into the classroom are along with uh, fabulous extra material, including interviews with book creators, copies of early drafts of the books, and fascinated, fascinating images of source material. And then on the CLA blog, you will also find a series of posts that uh, have been written by uh, members of the Biography Clearinghouse, uh, which are full of practical recommendations for teaching with biographies. So that's it, the Biography Clearinghouse in a nutshell, but um, now we should move on to the main event of tonight uh, of chatting with the wonderful book creators in our midst. So, Marianne. Thanks, Anya. So, our first question uh, for the panelists is, what do you think draws readers to biography? <laughs> you could have called on us. Um, I was gonna say, it's just, to me, it's just a very simple thing. I just think people love people. Most people like people. And, um, even when I'm in schools, you know, what teachers, when when we were in schools, um, you know, there's a lot of like, stop socializing, kids, stop socializing. Kids love to socialize, you know what I mean? People love people. And so I just think that biography is just the story, stories of people. And it's kind of an easy, to me, it's kind of like an easy in to any subject is learning about the people who, you know, who did it, who cared about it. That's so mine's just easy. I mean, that's <clears throat> how I feel about it. I'm going to chime in and just say, I, I completely agree. I think that as humans, we're all looking for that kind of connection. And there's something about biographies that help us to think about maybe how our lives align with other people's. And so um, I know for me, I remember um, years ago when I first started looking at biographies and reading biographies as kind of mentor text for my own writing, I remember looking at Kathleen Krull's series about Her internet froze, I think. I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, so Tanya, maybe do you want to share some sure. of your ideas and sure. we'll see what happens? Um, you know, I was thinking, uh, I agree with both of the things that they just said. Um, and in addition, I think when I was a kid, I liked nonfiction. And what was available to us as nonfiction when I was a kid was so, um, so much more diminished than what is available now. Right. And I think there's a huge component now of I can be, I can. I can do anything. I can be anything. There are so many people, so many stories of quote unquote ordinary people who are extraordinary. And it kind of ends up um, collectively sort of, um, you know, giving us the notion that everybody is extraordinary and everybody's life story has something fascinating in it. And I think it's up to the biographer to find what that piece is and give readers a window into that. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa, you're back. I'm back. I don't know. I've been fine with my internet all day. And of course now 
right now, it's having a little bit of an issue. So hopefully, nice. we'll see in, hopefully. <laughs> so we, yeah, if you wanted to finish, the last thing we heard was you were talking about when you began to read Catherine Kroll's work as a mentor text for your own writing. Yeah, I really did love when um, her titles would read, you know, the lives of artists and what the neighbors thought. And I thought that was so fascinating, you know, just this kind of inside peek into someone's life I found incredibly fascinating as an adult. And so I, I know that kids really, I mean, 50% of kids really do love nonfiction text. So I know that just that inside peek into someone's inner life really gives a lot of not only information to kids, but just um, a, like a just a, an inner glimpse into someone's life, I think, provides this really great connection. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Such a humanizing genre. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Thank yeah. you so much uh, for that. Um, second question that we had is, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think happens to readers readers of biography? In other words, how can biography change and shape a reader's sense of the world and of, of themselves even? Well, that's actually related to sort of what I was starting to say mm -hmm. in, the, in the last question. I think that the world of possibilities is, is awaiting every reader in the pages of all of these different books about all of these different people. Everybody starts out the same, just a person who grew up in a family who had an idea and did something. And that can be anybody. And so I think that it's um, it's in, it's unendingly inspiring. And there's something there's a there's a story for every kid to be inspired and and kind of being driven to follow what they want to do. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I I think that readers can grow with biography in a way that. Um, it's just really special. You know, there's that like, there's an old quote, which of course I should have a source for and don't. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Abe Lincoln didn't know he was gonna be Abe Lincoln, right? Or even yeah. like, someone unknown that we, cause we've all written books about people who are less known than that. You know, Nek Chan didn't know he was gonna build a garden, you know, that it would still be there after his death, you know? Um, and I just think that that's just such a, um, it just comes from such a great point of growth you know, that, that we can all grow into all kinds of things that we don't ha know we even may grow into, you know, as we as we get older. And I just think that um, it also, biography also can just really provides a diverse range of humanity while still kind of staying close to that all of our emotions are pretty similar, you know? And I think that that emotional piece is really important too. I don't know if, if you, you, other two creators do. If you find that, I find the emotional piece of what I do, especially over time, is becoming more and more important to me. Um, Boy, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I do need to feel that emotional connection. Yeah. But I would say that for me too, I, I think that um, certainly what I think happens for readers or biography. I know when I, w when I was a kid, um, there, were, there were so few biographies about people of color that I could read. And so for me, writing books, uh, writing biographies about people of color shows readers that their history is important um, and that there's something very powerful about having your history written down and recorded. And so I think that that's an incredibly powerful piece as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add something interesting. So we're talking about young readers, but we're also talking to educators. Um, I'm also a college professor, and um, I've noticed a huge disconnect between, we think kids love nonfiction, right? But my college kids say they don't like nonfiction. Uh -huh. Except first semester, freshman year, I use Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth, the Warmth of Other Suns. And they say, well, we love this. And I'm like, <laughs> it's nonfiction. Yes. It's the best book ever. It's just the best. It's the best book ever. <laughs> the best book. Our books are the best books ever. Both of them. The most <laughs> that I've read. I haven't gotten cast yet, but I hear that's yeah. oh, fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. I'm thinking about what you said, Barb, about, you know, Abe Lincoln didn't know he was going to grow up to be Abe Lincoln. And I'm just thinking about this particular year. And a year ago, if we were having this conversation, it would be a totally different context. And none of us knew a year ago the challenges that we were going to rise to 
over the course of, of 2020. And all of the people we read about in the newspaper, uh, the doctors, all, all, of the, all of the folks who have been helping strangers, uh, community members. And so I don't, I don't think we often live our lives thinking we're living history, right? It's really easy to just be caught up in the day to day. But the unique vantage point of this year is to see ourselves in this particular moment in time with a, with a before and ideally coming soon and after, um, which I think gives us a new lens for thinking about real life stories and, and the power they have for us in our lives. Yeah, so, there are new problems to solve and new heroes rise up to do that, which it's, I yes. think, really. All around us mm -hmm. in our communities. So with that, we're curious as to what drew each of you to write your first biography. Who was that person and, and why that person? Uh, I, I can jump into that. That's a, that's a, like, that particular story is like part of my teaching gestalt, right? <laughs> um, I was, I, I don't know if anybody knows this, but I, I used to be an editor. And then, um, I had my first six or seven years of a writing career doing library market nonfiction, right? So I was churning out books about animals and presidents and history, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I mean, I, I came from educational publishing and children's nonfiction at Macmillan and then at Black Birch, but I started to ask myself, who do I wanna be as a writer? I'm, I was getting a little bored writing those books over and over again. It was awesome for my chops and my skills and my photo research and all of that. But I wanted to write who I wanted to write about. Um, and so I set out to tackle the picture book biography and write something for the trade. And I researched and wrote um, a, a manuscript about Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And I sent it to my like dream picture book biography editor, who was Christy Ottaviano. Um, and it got rejected. And then it got rejected like a thousand more times, you know? <laughs> and I, I said, okay, I haven't cracked this nut yet. So I kept trying to figure out how to learn how to do it. And I worked on something else and I was progressing. And then one day I was watching HBO's Iron Jawed Angels about Alice Paul. And I got so upset. And I realized that what was missing from my manuscript was my authorial voice and any kind of emotional connection like Lisa mentioned earlier. And I literally got up off the couch and didn't even look for the old manuscript. I wrote what then was, I wrote right off the top of my head, what was then the first page of Elizabeth Leads the Way, found the manuscript, attached that to the beginning, sent it to Christy and she bought it. Hmm. And wow. that to me was like the aha moment of, if you're gonna do this, you better do something that you really love and you really care about and, and and that better be in there. Otherwise, why bother? Yeah. Yeah. So that's my story. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, I also watched that movie with my daughter, who at the time was in fourth grade, and they had to choose someone, a hero to be that year. And then she chose Alice Paul. And mm -hmm. then we dressed, she dressed up as Alice Paul. <laughs> <laughs> it was just such a great, it was a great project. But her in an old shawl, like it was just, it was hysterical. But anyhow, I did like that movie. So, um, <laughs> well, I, um, I was at home actually um, with, I had just given birth to my first child and I was at home and I had formerly been working as a copywriter. Um, I hadn't started writing yet. Um, and I was, you know, going to be content to be at home as a stay at home mom for a while. And I was miserable. I, I, I hated <laughs> stay at home. <laughs> and, um, and so I wasn't really wanting to suffer in silence. So I was complaining nonstop. And finally my husband, James, who is a children's book illustrator said to me, why don't you start writing? And he said, he gave me this book and it had um, a collection of um, athletes. He said, um, there's a great story in here about Satchel Paige, Nick Rocket Pitcher. And I think that you should write his story. It'd be a great picture book. And I thought, he's so stupid. Like, I don't even, <laughs> I, don't know I don't know who Satchel Paige is. This guy's an idiot. And so I read it. And then I thought, oh, this is actually a really interesting story. You know, it doesn't have to be about baseball, it could be about a man who transcended the sport 
of baseball and kind of took the sport of baseball and made it his own. First of all, I had never heard of such, I never even heard about the Negro Leagues, which in itself tells you a lot about, yeah. you know, our educational system oh, and yeah. how is it possible yeah. that I didn't know the Negro Leagues yeah. at 28 years old. But I dived in and the Ken Burns documentary was out. Mm -hmm. And then Satchel Page was my first pitch book biography. And yeah. I feel badly because I called my husband stupid and it's being. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell. We won't share the URL with him. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was really going to show. Um, I, I, I just want to say that. My whole writing, I used to write about, I can't tell you, but I, I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm trying to keep a dog happy in here. <laughs> when I first thought I was a stay-at-home mom, also miserable, sorry. Um, <laughs> I want you to love y'all to death, but no, not for me. But anyway, there I was. And um, I started writing for children. I was writing about brothers that didn't like each other, brothers that did like each other, because that was my life. I was writing about poodles who are <laughs> here right now. I have a white poodle over here, too. <laughs> yeah, well, we decided oh. to get me in the neck. And um, I was at a dentist's office and saw this, an obituary of a woman, an old lady hanging out of a car, a race car. And I went, why is there an old lady hanging out of a race car? Like, literally, how could this, wait a minute, women raced NASCAR in 1930s? Like, that was a thing? Like, to me, like, in somewhere in the 70s, there was Janet Guthrie in the back of my mind. That's all I knew. I didn't really know anything about the sport. Oh, my gosh, the dog's a pain in the neck. Hold on a second. And um, and I just started writing something completely different from a point of, um, yeah, and I had to get out this picture too. This is my grandpa. And that's me at three. And he had, he only told me stories about people and he told me stories all the time. People he met at work, um, people he used to know in the old neighborhood, people he knew in the other country that his parents came from, you know, or that he came from too. Um, people, people, people. And all of a sudden I realized I could tell a people story, you know, and it turned into my first biography and I don't know, there's a lot of them now. So it, I think it was just that it was a family storytelling connection without me even knowing it. I think I was trying to fit what I thought children's writing was into a, you know, into the slot, you know, of, of you know, whatever, of poodle books that I wasn't really going to be good at. And um, so that's how it happened. There's a quote from Eudora Welty where she says before, long before she started to write stories, she learned to listen for stories. And I, I feel like that's I, I, any any sense of story I have, I learned by through family stories that's a good around one. the table and on the porch. That's a really good down. quote. Yeah, I'm going to jot that down. Okay. Yeah. I think it's from One Writer's Beginnings. The other thing I think Probably that's fascinating me. about true stories, especially when you're working on one, is that if you talk about it, if you talk to people about it, you find these crazy crazy connections. Like I've literally like been on a train and started a conversation with somebody who asked me a question and I answered it. And you know, they had a relative that was related to the story. <laughs> it happens yeah. all the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tanya is so right today. My physical therapist, I, she was literally, I'm having physical therapy for a knee thing. And um, I, she said, I said, Oh, it's so weird. I'm, I'm going to write about this great lakes thing. And she goes, Wait, my fiance works at that place that you're talking. I was like, what? And so now I have a whole set of experts that I've been trying to reach and now I have an in. And it happens all the time. It's like it's like the universe. Don't you guys sometimes feel like the, the universe conspires to tell you write this story somehow? Yeah. And I know yeah. that sounds really kind of weird and like, you know, way more woo-woo than I am as a human being, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's true. It is yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. So um, through this conversation, the idea of emotional connection uh, that you share with the, the people that you write about and with your books and the, the themes that, that come through them has come through really intently. So um, I'm wondering uh, what kind of relationships do you develop with your subject over the course of writing for them? So there's something that sparks you wanting to write for them, but I bet that 
in the process of studying their lives and learning about them. I wonder what kind of relationship you develop with them and if you have any standout moments that uh, in your research or your writing process that some stories that you can share that allowed you to gain new insight or personal connections to your subject. I try to, I mean, <laughs> well, I try to, when I think about, um, when I'm thinking about a subject to um, explore, I kind of think about them in like the way I choose my friendships. You know, I, I think about mm -hmm. someone I want to spend a lot of time with, like someone I'm really interested in, someone I admire, someone might maybe who makes me laugh or someone whose qualities I really like or I aspire to have. So I, I know that I'm going to be spending months with this person and long days and nights. So I'm really, um, you know, again, looking to make that kind of emotional connection. And I'm always happy um, when it happens. Sometimes, you know, you're diving in and you don't feel it. <laughs> And, and that has happened on a couple of occasions that I've had to abandon something because I just, I didn't feel anything and mm. I had hoped for something and I just didn't. I, I, I remember once doing research for a project about um, Dave Brubeck, um, the jazz musician, and I, it was going to be a story about this jazz cowboy. And I was reading the, the Ken Burns um, book. And, you know, he is, the book is constructed in a way where he does a little um, vignette about, you know, one artist and then he moves on to another. And he kept referencing, you know, it would be Dave Brubeck and then it'd be a little bit about Louis Armstrong and another artist, whatever. But I noticed whenever he, he would write about Louis Armstrong, that was what kind of made my heart race. And so when he got to, when I'm, <clears throat> when I go back to Dave Brubeck, I'll be like, oh. Dave Brubeck. <laughs> so I, as much as I love Dave Brubeck's music, it, it was the Louis Armstrong piece that really kind of made my heart race. And I, and after a while, I just gave up. And I said, I think I'm supposed to write a Louis Armstrong story. And that's how I came to the story, Just a Lucky So and So. That's how I wound up writing that book. That's nice. And, yeah. that's nice. <laughs> um, I've had the honor of writing about some living people. And so that's always a different experience. Um, I would say for me, it was Walter Morris in Courage Has No Color. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that that was a 10 year deep friendship. Um, we spent a lot of time together on the phone um, and long, you know, long after my manuscript was done. So um, mm. it, it actually came out on his 92nd birthday. And um, he was living down in Florida then, and he had some fellas over, and I was on the phone with him, and we were just sort of hollering and cheering. And oh. It was like, such an unbelievable honor to be able to tell this man's story, who had literally been trying to tell it for like 60 years, you know? Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I fell in love with him. I mean, I miss him every day. and. Mm. Yeah, I, I kept, uh, he's, he used to leave me messages on my answering machine and I kept a few of them like on, you know, on a little oh. audio clip so I could hear it once in a while. Oh. Um, and also kind of related to that, like when I'm writing about real people, I end up, if there's that con kind of connection and you're, you're also looking for more information about the family and trying to understand the intricacies of the relationships and hopefully have some photographs to be able to share. So I also, you know, got to know his daughters and um, some of his friends and, you know, it just sort of rounds out the whole thing and, and it's no longer just a book. It's, it's, ju it's just not, it's just not just about the book, you know, it's about being able to, it's like being able to help somebody tell their story. Mm -hmm. And he literally was on the record on oral history archives, like every decade. And I think it's one of the things that kept him young was telling, you know, trying to tell his story and, and have it be out there. So for me, that that's for me that's the one that makes me like I yeah. cry when I start to think about it because I miss him. I mean, I loved him and I miss him. Mm. That's beautiful. Um, did you want to add anything, Barb? Oh, I just 
I'm going to sound like uh, I just literally talk to these people. <laughs> like, like, I don't know if anybody's ever had that experience, but if I get stuck um, while I'm writing um, or it's, you know, something's just not, it's not processing right. I mean, I literally like um, Otis and Will Discover the Deep. Otis Barton is a, is, was in real life kind of an odd duck. Um, and so I literally one day um, frustrated with the manuscript just was like, Otis Barton, you're like the oddest man in the world. You know, like how in the world do you want me to tell? You better, like, if you want this story told, this is all, I don't say this. Yeah. Um, if you want this story told, you're going to have to help me with your stupid lucky hat. And, you know, I had entire <laughs> conversations in my head. You and your stupid lucky hat are going to have to help me tell this story. Back away from the computer. The next day sat down. Boom. It was there. And again, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I don't know what that is. It's a connection. It is a connection that you feel like it's an emotional connection that you start to feel with people. And I have just recently finished my first story with a living, um, with a living of a living subject, and um, it has been a wonderful friendship. So Tanya, I really appreciate knowing that that's going to go on because if this doesn't go on, I'm going to really miss it. So I'm, you know, it's it's been wonderful. So thank you. So. Uh, we'd love to hear from each of you. Each of you has written picture book biographies. How do you take the entirety of someone's life and distill it down to a picture book manuscript? You don't. <laughs> yeah. You don't. You don't. Is the end. <laughs> the end. Well, that's that's it. It. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot like writing a single poem about some aspect of someone's right, right? Like, right. Yeah. It's, it's right. Capture it in so few words. So, um, you know, I think going back to that emotional connection that Lisa was talking about is that, you know, you you hone in on what your emotional connection is to the story. Like, what's your angle in, and you go with that. And mm -hmm. you know, and if there are pertinent for me, if there are pertinent details from parts of their life that are important. Um, then I weave them in, but I certainly don't try to tell the whole story. No, that's what author's notes are for, right? <laughs> yeah. That's not even close to the whole story. I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's always better to let an interesting fact or an experience go than to lose the focus of the whole book. You know, when you lose it, you know, you really, it, it's just a matter of focus and it's like kind of like a laser focus. You know, this is this is what I'm writing about. I am not writing about all of this, you know, and it's just a matter of um, that's got to go and that's got to go. I mean, my initial drafts are sometimes ridiculously like over 2000 words. And then it, and it is just a matter of, all right, that's not what you're writing about. What are you writing about? And then, you know, taking just just really focusing, focusing. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 all killing your darlings and yeah. um just um, focusing your energies. And I mean, it's it's difficult because you can find all these incredibly interesting anecdotes and little stories to tell. Um, but I, I was with, I was on a panel recently with someone who talked about, the, you know, the purpose of writing biography isn't to show off your research, it's to tell a story. And so, um, you know, you have to keep these these things in mind. And again, it's, it's like what Tanya said, you have to you know, some of these things, it's really about a narrative, especially for young readers. And so some of these um, facts can slow down a narrative. I mean, you want to provide information, but you sometimes you have to move a lot of things to the author's note. And also, I mean, thank goodness for editors, right? I mean, they, they help us, <laughs> help us to, to pare things down. Um, and, you know, you can just get really attached, attached to your, to your information and to your subject. Um, and it gets hard to, to, to pair away what needs to be paired away, but you, you really do have to focus on the part of a person's life um, and the narrative. So that's that's where your focus lies. Yeah. Best yeah. editorial note. Best editorial note I ever got was literally around most of an entire page. There was just an editorial note. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> <Ouch. Thanks. Okay. laughs> I guess it can go. I kept thinking. <laughs> know this you need to know this it's the coolest thing you need yeah, to know this. Yeah. I had nothing to do with no. story. <laughs> <laughs> like what what is that like it was almost like 
He's randomly talking about something that you think is cool now. That is not what a book is. Yes. You know? <laughs> Um, I, I teach a, a, a whole semester long course on, on writing picture books. And one of the ways I um, explain to my students the answer to that question is, you know, look up how many picture books there are about Abraham Lincoln. Not a single one of them tell his whole life story. They all tell some slice of that story mm -hmm. that that author found really compelling. And so I think like that's maybe a helpful way to look at it, especially for educators and, and aspiring writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you for, thank you for that. Um, that the idea of uh, finding what moves you and what's interesting and a new compelling um, aspect of somebody's life to write about can be, that's what distinguishes the different biographies, for example, for Abraham Lincoln, like you said, like, you know, if, if, if you're going to write what has already been written, the way it's already been said, what, what's your angle, what's the, what's your way in and what's your emotional connection, it sounds like. Um, so um, we are wondering if you would like to share now some of what you're working on now or current or future projects that are you're making emotional connections with and are driving your uh, creativity. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll go um, because I, I mentioned it. I just finished a picture book about Katie Payne who is an acoustic biologist um, who made early discoveries about whale song. I'm still working on it. I shouldn't say it's finished. Sorry, big mistake. Um, so anyway, she made early discoveries about whale song. Also, the um, woman who went on to discover that elephant communi elephants communicate through infrasound. That's one human being. Um, and I stayed with her for three days and she's a lovely person, now a friend. She's amazing and I cannot wait to share her story. It's really cool. Awesome. Um, I, I right now I'm I can't talk that much about it, but I'm working on a book about a civil rights icon. But I do have um, a couple of um, interesting books coming out in the coming year. One about Shirley Chisholm called Loud and Proud, yeah, so and nice. I have another book um, releasing called Of Walden Pond which is the story of um, Henry David Thoreau and Frederick Tudor, who was called the Ice King, and how they were both drawn to the riches of Walden Pond for very different reasons. Wow, cool. That's a good one. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Building a mystery right there. <laughs> Oh, me. Um, yeah. I, I was reading about their books and how interesting that is. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a Rosalind Franklin picture book that'll be coming out in about a year. Um, maybe less, actually. So, I mean, that one's, <clears throat> I'm done with it. Um, and I just turned in my uh, next long form narrative nonfiction book for Candlewick called Peace is a Chain Reaction. Um, and that is a, a fairly complicated triangulated story that um, has to do with uh, some folks in Japan, some folks in Oregon, and the main link to all of these people uh, who was an interned uh, Japanese American teenager during World War II, grew up to be an anthropology professor at University of Michigan, and ended up connect, bringing all of these people together um, in a process of healing for some things that happened during the war. So it's a it's a very specific story that has um, really wide reverberations about peace and forgiveness. Wow! So that's been really interesting to kind of immerse myself in that. When you were asking the question about, you know, who are you connected to? I'm kind of re-experiencing now because that gentleman passed away a few years ago. Um, so I'm kind of re-experiencing that feeling of connecting with family members of those mm. people that you're writing about and really learning more about their family and, and what their family was like and 
Um, you know, all those details that only come from nurturing relationships with the people that you're writing about if you are, if you happen to be writing about people who are alive. Mm. So that's been really interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Erica, I think we have some questions in the, in the comments. Do we have time? I think we do. So I'm just going to start from the top. Uh, let's see. All right. So you'll see it come up on the bottom of the screen. Oh, here. wow. There's a lot of questions in there. So fancy. There's a few. It is very fancy. Wow. <laughs> so Jessica wants to know, as a writer, how do you handle supposition? Mm -hmm. Filling in descriptions or adding layers to pull in readers when exact details are unknown? Great question. Ooh. Research, uh, research, research. <laughs> yeah, she's saying that exact details are unknown. I, I'm going to just go on record to, to say that none of that supposition can be anything that isn't completely known. Right. Yeah. Right. As, a, as the beginning of answer. I think as a as a reader, I'm just thinking about you know my experiences on on the Orbis Pictus Committee and reading manuscripts and thinking about this very issue and it's such an important question and just how powerful it is for me as a reader when I'm reading your books and you say you you add in those words may it may have been this it could have been that but we don't know and being really clear about those gaps yeah and, so and even the, the, even those suppositions have to be based on research right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's tricky. It's a slippery slope, right? It is a slippery yeah. slope. Yeah. Oh, friend Chris oh, Martin. This yeah. Person. Yeah. Oh, this person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'd hey, like to know. For, just for our audience, uh, one of Chris's books is is part of our initial content on the biography clearinghouse. So if you're interested, you can find it there. Sorry. <laughs> so Chris would like to know, for educators whose familiarity with biographies for young readers may be limited to those they encountered mm -hmm. in their youth decades ago, could the panelists talk a bit about what's changed since then? Well, um, I would like to um, this. So I, I will say that from from my youth, I used to believe that I really hated biographies, um, in part because I, when I was young, read biographies about people who were basically perfect. Um, <laughs> the biographies I read about were about people who really had very perfect lives. Their, their families were perfect. Their grades were perfect. Um, but now I think that there is a certain shift toward allowing us to see the fullness of a person, their flaws, um, like the complexities of a subject's life. And um, I know that there was a book that I, I, worked, I worked on recently, it came out recently called um, Not Playing by the Rules. It's a book uh, called 21 Female Athletes Who Change Sports. And I featured, you know, all these women athletes. One of them was Babe Diedrichsen, who was an incredible athlete. I felt I had to include her but Babe Diedrichsen was also anti-Semitic and a racist. Um, and my editor and I had to go over, we discussed, do we include her? Do we not include her? We had to include her because she, she was an incredible athlete. She was probably the world's best female athlete. But in the back matter, we did include this other part of her life. It was a huge part of her life, but she was anti-Semitic and she was racist. Um, and so I think in the past, we haven't allowed young readers to see that people mm -hmm. are flawed. Um, and so now I think that, that it's okay to do that. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And, and, I, and I think it's um, necessary to do that because it makes those people human, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we yeah. all sort of read, and, and then there were those fictionalized biographies that we, will, we won't name that had <laughs> orange covers and then had blue covers. Yes. Those were the bane of yes. my yes. existence. And honestly, yes. they are a big reason that I write biographies because I'm angry that I have so much knowledge in my brain that I don't know whether it's made up or not because of those books that I kind of vowed I would never do that to a kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, this is a perfect okay. follow-up question oh, yeah. Yeah. from BC. Uh, are fictional biographies acceptable? Real biographies with facts that cannot be confirmed. And do you have examples of these? So those are two different things, I think. Right. right? Mm -hmm. so, first of all, I would say, what is a fictional biography? It, to me, it's like, I have no problem with people making things up that are based on history, as long as you don't call it nonfiction. Right. Call it historical fiction and we're good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I mean, there's often the question people, you know, have, a, 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 it's a biography, but it has invented dialogue. That's not a biography. Right. Uh, you, you can't have a biography with invented dialogue. No, we don't know that they said that. And so that's not nonfiction. Right. I mean, that's thing for me, because, um, you know, a book, The Noisy Paint Box, which is a book that, you know, people, people know, I never thought of it as a biography, but it was definitely, you know, kind of like, I don't know, promoted like that. Definitely, you know, um, teachers use it like that. And it is definitely, I mean, invented biography, the very first sentence, I believe, or two of the author's note is this book is like, you know, this is a piece of historical fiction. Yes. And here's where I got the information and here's yes. what parts are true and here's what parts are not. Um, I think that people tend to think because of the blue book cover, biographies that we that are not to be named um <laughs> that that that's about you know just because i'm writing about a real person that it's automatically a biography and we have yet to kind of address that in the biography clearinghouse but i hope that we do yeah. because you know i think that people think any story about a real person is automatically biography and that's mm -hmm. not the case yeah in my yeah. i think the other problem too is this um slippery slope that came about when the term creative nonfiction was coined right it's an extremely oh, problematic term what is that because i will tell you that you know there are people who teach college who think the creative nonfiction until it, until until somebody gives a lecture that says otherwise right who people that think creative nonfiction, not for any fault of their own is nonfiction that has creative liberties taken with it when in mm -hmm. fact no creative nonfiction is nonfiction that's everything in it is true, but you're using all of the tools of fiction writing at your disposal, like s setting and character development and plot development and specificity of detail. And that's the creative nature of creative nonfiction, not that you can make things up. Right. Yeah. And I always want to say like, who wants to read the non-creative nonfiction? <laughs> <laughs> Why would you waste your time? Like, oh, I want to read that really bad. What, what does that mean? I, you know, I, that one always gets me. I'm like, really? Because like, do you, yeah, whatever. From Susan, what are your thoughts about writing a biography in a graphic novel format? That's cool. Go for so it. Cool. So cool. I mean, I don't know if anyone's read, you know, John Lewis's March. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, so what about the invented right dialogue here. that so often happens there though? So like, I know, look, I don't know why we can't say graphic nonfiction. Like we talk about graphic books mm -hmm. and we say graphic novel for everything because I think those were the first to emerge in this sort of new format. But really there's graphic nonfiction, there's graphic biography and there are graphic novels. Yeah. So that role of the speech bubble. Uh, so. How do you know how do we, how would that work with biography and and sources? You know, I, I just think that's that's fascinating. But that and, and the illustrator has to be heavily involved with the with the research process and the accuracy issues. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> that's and, and any student of mine, I always have to have my spiel about the graphic. Why do we say graphic novel for everything that's a graphic book? Because I, I just think we lose an opportunity there to again, like any graphic book can be any genre. You can have fantasy graphic. Fiction, yeah. and you can have nonfiction, gra graphic nonfiction, gra graphic biography. And I just think it's important to be honest with kids about the differences, but the potential there is extraordinary for all of them. Yeah. Right. Though it would be anticipating that part of it would be challenging because of the speech bubbles. Then what do you do with the dialogue in mm -hmm. the, you know, if you're writing a graphic biography in as a graphic as a, a biography as a graphic book then you would have to contend with the issue of dialogue so unless somebody's life was really captured in video in in really um uh robust ways it uh 
it, it could be an interesting problem to solve uh, to, how to create it in, in yeah. a graphic uh, book format. Yeah, I think that's why the first examples that are coming to mind are memoir, like March. Right. And yeah, like exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's see. From Debbie, which point of view do you find it's best to write in for picture book biographies? I think it's a, I think I, I don't think I've ever written in anything but third person for that. Maybe a little second person thrown in there once in a while. I've, I've written in first and I've written in third. It, it depends. Um, sometimes there's a certain immediacy and an intimacy when you're writing first. I've written Word Set Me Free, um, Story of Frederick Douglass in first person. Mm. So I, I wanted to really convey uh, um, the character's kind of rage and feeling of being an enslaved young boy. But at the same time, I've also, for the most part, used third, but every once in a while, I, I've used first. Ooh, I'm adding that to my my uh, book list for spring. <laughs> oh, okay. now, I can use, now I can use a first person, first person yeah. for example. From Barbara, how do you deal with keeping accuracy of time period of a subject versus what's acceptable today. Um, for instance, calling someone a nickname in the past might have been common like shorty or fatty, but is not okay today. I mean, I guess if it's in historical context and it's a true, it's a true fact and it's, and it's backed by research and it's important to the story to include it. Like, so I think those would be all the different kind of check marks as to whether or not you wanted to do that. Right. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think I think the importance of it is really would be really key. Like, if you leave it out, is it going to change everything about the story? You know, I, it, yeah, I I think it's the how important is it to put it in? I think sometimes all of us, um, you know, we get we get um, you know, we get really into our facts and the things that we know and and what we and so even even some of our feelings, like oh, I I wonder what like that felt like to be called that nickname or whatever. But unless it's pertinent to the story, I don't know that all of that is necessarily um, useful or per or pertinent. But if it is, go ahead and do it. That's what an author's note is for, perhaps, is to explain that you're not being insulting, but you're being accurate to the time period. Depends. Hmm. Everything depends about this. You know, depends. <laughs> it all depends. We can't uh, hear you, Erica. You're muted, Erica. My boys were going wild oh. <laughs> in the background. Um, we're just about at the end of our of our time together. And this, what an incredible conversation! I could I could listen to you all talk for hours, but I want to respect your time, and you've already given us an hour and we're so grateful for it and i want to respect the time of the people who are joining us this evening so um i just give you a chance to say a last word marianne or xenia if if you would like and then i'll take it from there my house is a little loud i apologize <laughs> dance class going on down the hall. Um, but I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And also to, again, reiterate, please please check out our site, thebiographyclearinghouse.org. Uh, there's a whole team of book creators and educators that have worked hard to make it happen. And some content is up there now and content will be added over the course of this school year. So we're eager to hear what you have to say. We're eager to have your feedback. Um, there's a contact information on the website so you can let us know. And I just wanted to also do an official shout out to our Biography Clearinghouse team um, because really all of them, um, all of them could be up here uh, tonight. So yeah, and I wanted to quick add that if you're interested in getting updates uh, when new content is added on the Biography Clearinghouse and on the homepage, we do have uh, a place where you can uh, in, in, input your contact information. So then whenever we add new content, you will, uh, you will receive a notification for it. Wonderful. I have spent some time on the website and I was absolutely blown, blown away. 
my previous life, I was a teacher and I was almost, I mean, I'm not leaving, but I was almost inspired. I was like, I need to go, I need to go teach some kids some stuff. It was really so impressive. It's really amazing. Um, so we have um, some winners this evening. Uh, Tanya and Barb and Lisa were kind enough to donate a book um, as a giveaway each. And so I will let you all know that Yolanda Payne will receive one and Nadia Ali will receive one and Emily Truitt will receive one. And I have your emails from your registration. So we will be in touch with you that way. Um, and in case you all can't see on the panel here, what's happening in the chat, there's a lot of thank yous. A lot of that was inspiring uh, and a lot of excitement here. And it, and it truly, truly was. So thank you all for your time. Uh, and I so look forward to any opportunity uh, to feature any of you again on Stimula Live. So Thanks thank for you having everybody for Thanks thank for you everybody us. for joining thank us. You. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Barb and Marianne, for making this all a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> nice <laughs> job. Great job. <laughs> Great job, everybody. Be well and stay safe. Thanks. You too. Good night. Take care. Good night.